Welcome to the Omnibus Twins Gaming Channel. Today we're going to be reviewing Rudger Dorn's Asante. Alright guys, so this is how Asante is going to be laid out on the table. You're going to see we're using different money here because I think that the money that comes in the game is just a little bit bland. You know, yeah, it represents gold, but it looks kind of bland. So we've replaced our money with different beads and shells to just kind of keep the theme. I would suggest, if you have the opportunity, do a little bit of upgrading here and there. It really keeps the fun in the game. So we're going to go through a real quick look at how this game works, and take a look at the cards as we're playing, because this is Michael Menzel art. It's beautiful stuff. So, to start out, I'm going to take these action points that are on my side of the table, and I'm going to be spending them for each action I take. Now. I could use one of these to draw, but I got a really good hand this time, so I'm actually going to skip my draw phase and go straight into playing cards. So I'm going to start my turn, and I'm going to use these two action points here, and I'm going to put them over on Sarah's side of the table, and I'm going to do two of these buy cards. The first one of those is going to cost me five of my gold, so I'll pay five gold to the bank, and that's going to get me green, sugar, and fur. And I'm going to put those here in my market stall like this. Now you'll see I'm taking up three of my spaces, which means I only have three more spaces. So this is going to fill me up, and I'm going to have to sell them. So this one here will cost me five, and it'll get me fruit, it'll get me silk, and it'll get me silver. Uh. Or oh, exactly. fur. Sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Silly. All right. So that has me a full stand, and that's going to leave me with three action points. Now, I'm actually going to end my turn and give all three of those action points to Sarah, and I'm going to use those three action points to take back a gold from the bank and place it in my stock. And then we'll move it on to Sarah's turn. All right, so it's my turn now, and I'm not entirely satisfied with my hand, so I'm going to spend an action to draw a card. So, oh my, I've drawn a card I already have. So I'm going to go ahead and draw another card. Now, when you decide you want to draw a second card, you have to discard the card you just drew. So that goes immediately over into this card pile. I use a second action, and I draw another card. Okay, that's perfect, because that right there gives me a wares card. So this is a decent wares card, because I can buy at a low cost and sell at a high price. So I'm going to keep that in my hand. So, next, I'm going to spend an action to play a strong box. Now this here is an artifact. You can tell by the leafy greens up in the corner there. That's the only way to tell that it's an artifact. So pay close attention, because this here means person or animal. That means artifact. Two very different things. All right, so I'm going to play an action to play the artifact. Now, when you play an artifact, you put it immediately on a piece of land. Whatever piece of land you put it on gets handed to the other player. So I'm going to play this here on Kilimanjaro, and that goes immediately over to Zachary's side. And then we pull another piece of land out, which just happens to be another Kilimanjaro, and it goes immediately out onto the table. Now, a piece of rules for these land cards. They do not go into your hand. They stay face up in front of you for the course of the game. Now, the cool thing about these land cards is uh, when you play them, you get to play them and use the number of actions that you have cards. So what this means is that if I had these two Kilimanjaros over here, it allows me to take any of the actions available to me with the Kilimanjaro card. So if I play the first one and discard it, I get to do that twice, and then the second one will only get me one. So if I had three of them, discard the first one, I get to do it three times, discard the second one two times, discard the third one one time. So it's a really cool stacking benefit that you get. 
Okay, so after that, I'm going to go ahead and play a wares card because I don't have anything in here. So I'm going to play this here. I'm going to buy for five and get a silver, a fur, and a sugar. So I'll discard that, pay my five, and get my wares, which I will immediately place in my little stall here. There we go. All right, now that leaves me with one action. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to play a character card or an animal card in this case. This is Flamingo. So now I am playing this. It says your opponent must decide to skip either his draw cards phase or his play cards phase. So I play that. Zachary makes his decision now. And I'm going to skip my draw phase. Okay, so he is not allowed to draw cards this next turn. And now it's his turn. Okay, so I skipped my draw phase because I'm going to be really sneaky about this. I'm going to spend my Kilimanjaro card to do a one-for-one -one exchange. So I am going to take this fur and I'm going to change it out for a silver. So now I have this really cool character card here that is going to let me draw as many cards as I have wares in more types than my opponent. So, Sarah here has three wares. I have six different kinds of wares. So regardless of the fact that I had to skip my draw phase, I still get to draw three cards. So, and that costs another action. So this actually turned out really good for me because I just drew pottery which has a really cool effect on it that is going to allow me to sell my cards as I have different types. So I'm immediately going to choose to play this card on Kilimanjaro here, just because. And then I'm going to choose to use it. So that and then that. And I'm going to sell everything I have, and I'm going to get to take 20 gold from the bank. And that is basically how that, that turn's going to work for me. I end up with this wasted one here. I'm not too worried about it because I'm ahead right now. So let's see what Sarah does to respond. All right, it's my turn. So on my turn, I'm going to go ahead and skip my draw phase. I don't feel like doing that right now. Instead, I am going to play on my strong box here. Now you can see on the strong box it costs three actions to play, but when I do that I get to draw two cards. So three actions immediately go over to Zachary and two cards go into my hand. The best part about this is that she doesn't have to discard either one of those cards. That's one of the benefits of playing these really powerful artifacts. All right, now one of the cards I drew is a generic wares. This means that if I use this I can buy any wares I feel like. I could buy silver, I could buy greens, I could buy fur, whatever I feel like buying. Four, three, and then sell it. The same thing works for selling. I could pick anything in here and sell it. Generic wares. All right, so right now, I'm going to go ahead and first I'm going to play another map card. So this here gets played immediately down here and that costs me that and I send that over to him and I reveal another card. All right, now for my last action, I'm going to sell all of my wares. So I have one that counts for every single one of my wares, and I get to sell them for 12. So that means all of my wares go back into the little pile, and I get 12. Gimme, gimme. There we go. All right. And that's going to be basically how this game works. We're going to keep doing this until one of us manages to get 60 gold from the bank. At that point, that player wins, and the other player just isn't a good merchant. Aww. Oh. <laughs> now let's go see what we think about this game. All right. Now that we're back from looking at the game on the table, let's kind of talk about our likes and dislikes with it. Um first big key for me is that this is illustrated by one of my favorite game illustrators, Michael Menzel, who you'll probably know from games like Shadows Over Camelot. Um, the art is this really cool kind of classic African theme, and it's done in a really nice kind of oil paint style. The art is carried through onto all of the pieces with that same styling, 
and you know overall I have to say the quality in this game is split really between excellent and not so good. So with your excellent quality you have all of your individual game pieces in these punch boards mm. and I <laughs> yeah uh, you I just touched them and they fell right out so there's not gonna be any torn pieces or any exacto knife no these came out perfect and they're very nice hefty cotton finished boards all the little pieces as well yeah the same cotton finishing so you're not going to have any problems with those components, your score pieces, your wares, or your uh, little stalls. The problem comes in when you get to the cards. Um, they're flimsy, they're thin, they just feel not good in your yeah. hands. You're definitely going to need to cover them, and with that comes another problem. These are not TCG size. They're not like Magic the Gathering or any of the cards you're going to be used to. They're taller, so they're not going to fit your standard sleeves, and they're narrower, so they're going to flop around in your standard sleeves. You're going to have to special order Euro game sleeves for these, which is kind of a pain. They're not too expensive, but now you've got to pay for all the shipping and everything to cover your game. I don't understand why they could cotton finish all of the components but nothing special with the cards which are what you're going to be handling the most and it's really a shame you've got Michael Menzel's art on here but then you've got this kind of blotchy semi uh, semi shiny yeah. surface and it really kind of dims down his art on these and any time that you get a teeny bit of a glare, you can really see every little scratch and everything that's happened to the card. So, uh, it, you have to knock them on that. It's kind of frustrating for a game that otherwise has excellent quality. Uh, you know, I, I have to give it better than average. Absolutely. The, Absolutely. the cards are a big downsize. But the artwork kind of makes up for it. Yeah, yeah. The... Quality in the rule book continues in kind. You have an excellent fold out rule book. Everything is separated very well into its own little sections. But at the same time, the art for the rule book is very sad. It's, it's just not there. And the graphic design isn't there. So, I mean, I, it it kind of scrapes in at a four for me. It's yeah, it's about a four for me as well, and it's mostly because of the cards and the meh rule book. Yeah, yeah. However, this game really comes back when it comes to ease of play. Mm -hmm. um, the rules are very simple for this game. There's a couple of them that are fairly ambiguous, and there's going to be a few symbols that you have to learn. Um, <laughs> yeah, we've got, you know, as far as the symbols go, the only ones you're really going to need to learn are on the land pieces, and we'll get a close-up of, we'll, did get a close-up of these on the table. Um, you've got a card symbol, you've got a little um, action symbol, you've got a gold symbol, and then you've got a one-for-one one and a question mark, which are easily explained in the rule book. Very simple. Um, so th the symbols are relatively easy to learn on everything except for your um, cards that you'll be playing. Yeah, your where, artifacts where, where, and where. your um, mm -hmm. persons and animal cards are going to be a little weird because instead of giving you just the type of card they are... They've got this tiny little border that you have to pay attention to otherwise you don't notice. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Now as to the symbols though, if you don't mind leaving your rule book open on the table, they're actually outlined really clearly with the symbol and exactly what you can do with them. So that's not too bad. Um, the game itself plays out really fairly quickly. Um, everything is pretty clear cut. I love these action markers. There is no way you can mistake who whose turn it is and how many of these they've got left. You just pass them back and forth on the table. It's very clear cut. The um, the wares and the stalls 
they're laid out in such a way that you can only fit the number in that you're supposed to have in. So that's really clear cut. You don't have to worry about accidentally having too many. The wares cards themselves are Super very clear cut. They tell you how many you can buy, how many you can sell, and what they buy and what they sell for. So there's no confusion there. And then as far as scoring goes, they give you the uh, ability to play a standard size game, and it's easy to tone it down from this 60 gold game to a shorter game. It, it scales really well. Um, I'm going to have to give this game a, a, a 5 for ease of play. Absolutely a 5, yeah. I, I loved it. It was a fast learn. I think there was only one rule in the entire game that we mistook, and that was a quick and easy fix. So. Yeah. Uh, replayability in this game for me, I love this game. Uh, I, I know when you talk about a commerce game, it doesn't sound terribly interesting, but this <laughs> is a very easy game to get into, and it's a very easy game to get quite cutthroat in. Yeah, without being too aggressive. Yeah. The, the cards and uh, the people you're going to play against each other have this sort of mild sense of humor to them. And a lot of the times what affects your opponent will also affect you, so you've got to be careful what you're playing. At the same time, this is a short enough game that you can get as cutthroat as you want to, and it's really not going to get to that stage where it's just mean-spirited. Mm -hmm. So, um, also... Because of the way that the game's set up, because of its theming, it's not really going to get old on you mm -hmm. because the mechanics just allow for, you know, almost like chess, you to just improve your game each time. So, overall, I have to give it a five there. May as well. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's... It may be lower if you don't like the theme, if you don't like the economics concept. Mm -hmm. I know, I came into this game dreading the thought of an economics-based game. I thought it was going to be the worst thing ever, but as soon as I started playing it, I realized it was a lot different than what I was imagining. And I think that's going to be the case with most people. Yeah. Is they're going to be put off by the theme, but as soon as they start playing it, they're going to realize it's not as bad as it sounds. Yeah, we're not talking <laughs> like one of those stock market spinner games where you're running numbers in your head. All the numbers are laid out for you on the cards. It's fast-paced, it's fun, it's competitive without being too competitive. Yeah. yeah, all the strategy really comes down to knowing what to keep in your market stall and how far to plan ahead. Mm -hmm. That's really what it comes down to. So this game, all in all for us, really easily pulls on the lower end of a five, I would 4. say. 4.5, yeah, yeah. somewhere we, there. We can't give it that perfect quality because there are some production value issues and there's some ambiguous rules to it. A couple, yeah. <laughs> but this is, this is as close to a five, I think, as we have reviewed thus far. I think. Yeah. <laughs> so all in all, absolutely, if you can get it inexpensively, invest in this game. You'll keep Absolutely. it on your shelf for years to come. If you got any questions about the way the game plays or where to get it, just stick it down in the comments and we'll get back to you. We'll see you guys later. Bye! <laughs>